your mic, yeah. You can just talk right here. You can put your head. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Okay, <laughs> okay. Come here, buddy. We'll just do this. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I, I really shared about Corey earlier, so I'll just quickly um, just tell you, I believe you're going to be blessed. And the personal time and ministry that's going to take place later, um, I encourage you that when you come, you sell it in your heart exactly, specifically what you're believing God for. But I believe it's going to be wonderful what Jesus is going to do through Corey today. It's going to be powerful because I've been with him, and I see what Jesus does. And so I believe you're going to be ministered to and blessed. So praise God. Thank you, brother. He came all the way. By the way, I'll add to this. He came all the way from Montana to be here Yeehaw. today. So praise God. There are still believers in Montana. There you go, brother. <clears throat> I, I trust I probably have to have a microphone, don't I, in order for the recordings to work because it's very terrifying to hear myself. <laughs> Since I was a kid, I sound like a nerd, you know, like one of those people with a lab coat, which I've worn lab coats, so I guess it's appropriate, but it's awkward. <laughs> yeah. I was a biology major and then chemistry. Anywho, so uh, a few of you, I guess, have already heard of me, but you're a very rare few because really no one has any reason to know of me. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I, just a quick check. How many people here are um, in need of personal ministry? That's not, that's not there. I've been in some of these words, literally everyone, so okay. So the, so the rest of you, I imagine that you're here mostly to learn how to look more like Jesus. Is that fair? Okay. That's going to be very convenient. Speaking of that, can, can we just go and go in or do I have to do any preamble? Okay, I guess I should probably give a little bit of background. I'm just a person, uh, just a Christian. As Cecil mentioned, I was going to say he stole my thunder. But I am just a Christian. So I don't have a particular ministry. I write software for work uh, or crystal reports and crap like that. Is that okay to say? Can you say crap? When I was a kid, that was a bad word, and we grew out of it. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we. I write software for labs, but anyway, my point is this: I have, in the last six years, seen thousands of people healed. And uh, when I travel on site to a client, it is extremely likely. If, in fact, you might be able to say it's incredibly unlikely that I will not have people brought to the work site to get prayed for. My boss, my boss's boss, my boss's boss's boss have all been healed. Uh, I've had people that have been fired from the facility <laughs> come the next month that I'm there because they had something bad happen and get healed. I've literally not seen them not get healed. Not once. They're not Christians necessarily. Some of them become Christians, but they're not Christians. They, there's just You find certain cultural groups are, are very... Uh, interconnected so uh, in fact if you make one Indian friend you've actually made 20 because they will Aww. tell about you you know and so that's that's the type of thing that occurs <clears throat> I say all that to say this we spend an awful lot of time in the body of Christ uh, desperately reaching out for that gifted person mm -hmm. and what I found that that means is that we've taken what God used as a uh, instrument to make us better and to help us, and we've actually turned it into a stumbling block and a hindrance. That's right. I wanted for years to be able to meet with someone who had a gift of healing because of a challenge we had in our life. I had uh, three boys born with cerebral palsy. They were triplets. We weren't planning to have kids, so that means, statistically speaking, four out of five of my children were not planned, so I'm really not good at planning, but very good at production. <laughs> so <laughs> it started me on a path, and I was looking for that next person. And what you find is it's very, very, very hard to actually get in contact with anyone uh, who you would recognize. Cecil was quite literally the only person who answered me back um, at a personal level, and it was actually Cecil who called me back. So that was an important step for me because it was when he was present in my house that I saw my first, uh, well, lay on the hands instantaneous change. I'd seen some miracles, but not quite like that. And uh, it set things in motion. But I found that, that that's not all, because you don't want, to, when the person leaves, the, then you don't have anything. It started a path, and it has been an interesting one. But this concept of gifted people is a real challenge. When I was 13, I remember getting regularly annoyed 
because I could play Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Chopin, Chopin is what I always wanted to call him, but you know, Chopin. Because, well, see, you went, wow. But, but my, my mom made me practice hours every day. It was maddening. So when a person would say, oh, look at that gifted boy, didn't feel like a gift because I tell you what, <laughs> being, <laughs> being gifted and working really hard at something, a person from the outside looking in, they look the same. And you make a mistake if you just assume when you see someone who goes, oh, well, if he goes pray for him, that'll happen. And it could, <laughs> right. When they haven't been told about a piano and they look at it and then it just starts coming out, well, that's gifted. But anyway, my point is this. When we're talking about the body of Christ, yes, each of us have a certain perspective. But gifts, I realized in, this, my, in my search to try to understand how to get one, Yes, you can ask for the greater gifts, but I want to point out something that we don't hardly ever reference. In Romans, there's talk about gifts. Does anyone know the list of gifts in Romans? And it's a figurative question. I don't really need you to answer. The point is, there are things that most people, if you were said that was their gifting, they'd be like, oh, okay. Gift of mercy. Gifting's a mercy. How about of giving? Yeah? I mean, there, there are a whole slew of them. Then you look in Corinthians. There's, you know, 13 or whatever there. But they're not all the same. Some of them overlap, but not all of them. And that tells me, oh, I wish I had a whiteboard. It'd be so wonderful. If you put a circle here, that's A, a circle here, B, and there's an intersection. It's very reasonable for you to assume that, okay, Romans has some of the gifts. Uh, you know, Corinthians has some of the others. There's some overlap, but there might very well be others that are not referenced. I mean, if you mention, as I'm going to say this pejoratively, I guess. I don't mean it that way. But if you're going to say something as boring as giving as the gift, you know, compared to miracles. You might be disappointed, like the person who got a bunch of, uh, if I gave every, every one of you a gift, it's like we're at God's table and you all receive that, and uh, one person gets giving, and they're like, oh, okay. The other person gets tongues. I'm like, well, that's a little better than what they got. And the person across the table opens theirs, and it's miracles. I'm like, yes. And everyone else is like, oh. You know, they're frustrated they didn't get the thing that they wanted because they're looking at it as something special, like a power. But scripturally speaking, gifts cannot be special powers. They're not special powers. They can't be. You know why? Because I've been given, you've been given, every spiritual gift. Okay? So if, every, if I've been given every blessing is technically the word it uses. So I, I, I want to be able to pull the scripture together so you can check me back, uh, root through it, try to find the flaws. If I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, you need to first know, oh, that's wonderful. See if I just use my faith faster. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make use of it. Thank you. Oh, you know, black and red are not the holiest of colors. But I'll, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, this is... This is great. I will, I will make use of it. Now, where was I? Something about gifts. Anywho, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. What is a blessing? What is a blessing? Here's, here's the difference between a, a blessing and just a manifestation. If I got a cold and I prayed for it and it got healed, I got the instantaneous. If I am now immune from colds, which I am, by the way, I have a blessing. All right? A blessing is effectively living from the kingdom principle on that thing continually. Now, you don't get hung up on that being your identity. You don't get hung up if the enemy tries stabbing you and wrecks you with a car, does some other method to get you. You don't get caught up in that because that's not your identity. All right? But if you have this place of believing that's constantly releasing life or finances or anything else, that is you living in that thing. So... You have enough to give to others, and you have enough to live in for yourself constantly. But it doesn't have to be just healing or miracles or anything else. My, but the point uh, I'm making is merely we have looked at the wrong thing. If the Bible's, Well, actually, what does the Bible say that gifts are for? It's for profit in one, in one verse, okay, and for the edification of the saints. Right. Okay, what's that word mean? That is a bit like this. Oh, actually, this is perfect. So... She's the marker woman, right? If, I, if I'm going to be equipped by her, it means that when she comes by with this bucket of markers, and I'm like, man, that woman's got markers out her ears. That's a wonderful. I wish I had a marker. And she goes, oh, here, here's your marker. Now I'm equipped with this marker, and I don't have to keep going to her. 
to learn how to get a marker. Does that make sense? That is what gifts are. It's perspective, a clarity of vision in which you see more clearly, like Jesus does, in a particular area. So if I'm doing this right, guess what I can do? I can help those who are interested get sharpened, take away the things that are wrong perspectives, and then just start growing. And pretty soon, that person looks like you in that area, and then you can learn from them. So you know why Paul was so frustrated with the, uh, the Corinthians? He actually mentions that, okay, they did all this sin. They were, they were like really embarrassing in the number of sins they did, but they operated in gifts an awful lot, and he's still frustrated with them. Why was he frustrated by that? Because in that church, not only were they individually sinning and all that stuff, they still had the person who does the healing, the person who does this, the person who does that, and everyone's just going to get their need filled, and they're manifesting their gift, and they're proud of their gift, and they're proud of the fact that people come to there for their gift. They're not sharpening each other and looking like Jesus. Mm -hmm. That church he left, it's like they just all budded. Mm -hmm. And now he comes back, and they're still in their individual silos, not looking like Jesus as a whole, individually doing their individual gifts. So it's actually a negative if we're all relying on individual gifts. Does that make sense? I, I don't know if I normally should do that. Are there any questions on that? Because this is so foundational to the understanding, I, I can't. Do you rely on the person? Do you have or, gifts? Or do you have specific gifts? Yeah, and now that's the other thing. Scripturally speaking, you know how we say the, uh, the gift was really moving that day? hogwash. That's actually not scriptural. Okay, there are situations where I will personally feel really empowered. I feel it. Now, all that is, is my flesh finally, for a small window of time, agreeing with my spirit. Yes, I will manifest more. But it's because I have less crap in my life. Doo-doo in the way. I have less doo-doo in the way. and <laughs> So I'm actually able to look more like Jesus in that moment. But that is not the Holy Spirit deciding, well, I'm moving now. I might feel, have that feeling leave me. That is not the Holy Spirit leaving me. Those are feelings. We have drawn a causation when there was only correlation. In other words, we have said that uh, when you have that feeling, that's the anointing upon you, and we've also seen manifestations. We've said, oh, the one causes the other. It's not that way. It's correlated, sure, because I got out of the way. So now let's look at Hebrews. I know you have a question. Give me one second. I'll, I'll read it to you because... My luxurious, nerdy voice. Oh, it's really hard. It's 1-1. One, one. <laughs> yeah. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, there's a whole lot more. It's awesome. I highly suggest you spend a month in just that chapter. But I want to point out something. How many here would agree that the Bible is the court of life? Meaning it has an answer to every important question in it. Most, right. This verse, this chapter, tells us that Jesus is the high court. He is the high court. Meaning, you can interpret the scriptures, you can interpret other people, you can interpret the apostles, you can interpret the epistles, all of it. You can interpret it through Jesus' life. That's very helpful. Now, you see how I've, I've taken gifts and told you their place and sort of made them lower, much much less important? How many times did Jesus talk about gifts? No. You know why? Because gifts are a little bit like this. Oh, I couldn't use it. So you have a prism. Now, I don't have all the colors because they only gave me two. But you have on one side, you know, you've got light coming in, right? you got one side purple or something. Roy G. Bibb. Let's say, okay, Roy G. Bibb. Red over there. Bib is be violet. So over here we got violet. This is pure white light. And I'm over here and I see red. Am I wrong in seeing red? No, that's what I'm seeing. And this person's seeing violet. Yeah. It's been a while since I've had Roy G. Bib things. Um, anyway, it's uh, the primary colors in case those are interested. Okay, so if this person positions themselves closer to here, you know, I realize I'm thing go weird sound wise if if I bring these people together like this pretty soon I don't see red in that position because I'm getting closer and closer to looking what the light looked like pure and when you have a Christian who's living an awful lot of these 
gifts and these, these things that they look like Jesus, guess what? You don't see a particular gift and you start seeing white light, just pure light. You're seeing Jesus. So why did Jesus not worry about gifts? Because he's manifesting like a son. He looked like what man looks like when God fills him. So he didn't have to say, well, we need Peter's gift of faith or whatever is to go out there. He didn't, it didn't cross because he was demonstrating, living it out, which is why Paul could be mad that they were manifesting gifts and they didn't look like sons yet because they were all separated in their own thing, doing their own silliness, and they weren't sharpening and looking like Jesus. Pretty, pretty cool, huh? Because you can use Hebrews to get rid of that whole hang-up. Maybe it's not as big a hang-up for you guys. I mean, I just know the things that I personally went through when trying to, to grow, and that was a major one. And if you guys are willing to be stretched, I'll give you the other really, 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 really big one. Okay. What things stop the power of God from manifesting? Okay. Anything else? Yeah. And all you're getting good understanding, so I'll grant you that as well. But technically, scripturally speaking, traditions of men, that's the things we add on to it. Yeah, and that's a tradition. But see, in that case, you're, you're changing your access to the kingdom to be on your works. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk on that in just a second because that's also important. I'm very aggressive when I pray and when I go around and about, and it, you might interpret it as works. It's not, it's not works in that sense, and I'll, I'll discuss that in a minute. But anyway, he said there's two things. Now, in, in context... When he mentioned unbelief, who was he talking to? Because this is so important, guys. I cannot emphasize this enough. Who was he talking to? That's right. So he wasn't talking to the daddy. He wasn't talking to the boy, right? Can we agree? Okay. So I am not allowed. If that's the one way he answered that question, guys, there's a one way the high court answered the question. I tread on thin ice when I add an option to what I see in the high court. What I mean by that is this. What's, the one of the, what's one of the most common things we do? And I say we. I'm including myself in this, guys. We tend to look at the person and say, what's wrong with that person? And then we do, and there's nothing wrong with trying to change a person because it's important to make them live this stuff out forever when you're gone. But what we have done is we've taken what is a good thing in that regard and added it to our list of reasons why a person doesn't get well and sort of stepped away from it and said, Get yourself straightened out. That's one of the most important changes when I was listening to Cecil's stuff earlier in my career is not the right word. Several, yeah, my walk. Thank you. Yes, my employment with Jesus. Uh, <laughs> it's true, the health benefits are out of this world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things uh, that was so critical, and it's, it, I told him this a hundred times probably, well, okay, literally maybe 20 times. One of Cecil's strengths is teaching you how to, to monitor and harness the way you think on the inside. Yeah. Okay? That was absolutely and utterly foundational for me growing, but then I ran into a wall saying, well, what about how that person's thinking or believing? Now, does anyone, can anyone tell me right off the bat what are signs for? Who's it for? What's the target audience for science? Oh, man. Well, then that would be a real problem if unbelief was an issue. <laughs> because the biggest, most coolest, awesomest miracles, you're supposed to do those in front of a room full of unbelievers. Oh, boy. That's a real pickle. Yeah. <laughs> The reason I'm saying that is this. We, we use Jesus' life as an example to clarify scripture, and that will solve 99.9% .9 of the problems unless, unless we even interpreted, interpreted the situation with Jesus incorrectly. Now, why do you think I may have brought that up? It's because we think of Jesus as being limited in his hometown, saying, well, he didn't do any mighty works. Well, technically, that's not scriptural. He said he did no mighty works except except which means he did. So if I said I went to a university and I taught no math except for calculus, you would say, well, he taught some calculus, he taught some math. Mm -hmm. So we can immediately take this and say, instead of saying no mighty works, no, he did mighty works. He didn't do a lot of them. Now here's the other thing we pull from it. 
it says that he laid his hands on some, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship with the ones that he was allowed to put his hands on and the ones that got healed. He had 100% success for those that allowed it. Andrew's taught you guys, for those that are uh, in school, he's taught you about the various forms of unbelief. I think two or three he lists. There's a fourth that I don't often hear of, but it's the uh, unbelief of rejection. So now, in context, look in Scripture. Check this out when I'm gone. Check this out. You'll find, uh, like, the, the parents of the boy who was blind for 40 years. or Yeah, he was born blind. So 40 years old, he's, uh, he can now see. They didn't want to say anything more because they were afraid of getting kicked out. It was their kid, and they were still afraid of being kicked out. So now imagine Jesus walking into town, healing people, going all the way to the temple, and people are getting set free. And then the leadership saying, who is this man? And that's scriptural. That's in there. Who is this man? We know his mother. We know his father. Ironically, they didn't know. We know where he's from. Ironically, they didn't know. But they, they rejected. And guess what people do? Followers tend to, like, oh, yeah, no, no I, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. So he was stopped in place because Jesus does not force. I, I have yet to this day to say what, when someone says, well, I prefer you don't pray for me. I'm like, well, that's too bad. <laughs> I, have, I have yet to do that. So I suspect that Jesus wasn't willing to do that either. Now, if you look at Mark and Matthew, those are the chapters, that's, or the books in which it's referenced. I think it's, I don't know, chapter 6 for one and chapter 11 or 13 for the other. But you can find it. <laughs> you see that they even have a difference in perspective on what they consider to be mighty works. Okay, so for one, you realize that laying the hands on them and then instantly change the other one. One calls that a mighty work. The other one's like, oh, it hardly bears mentioning. That's really what is happening here. You get two perspectives on the same thing, but still, they both agreed. One-to-one -one ratio, we healed every single person we prayed for in the worst place of unbelief. Now, here's, here's even more for y'all. This is great. If I were to ask you, what's the most unbelieving city you can think of in Jesus' day? Can anyone give me some guesses? Jesus really strange. So. <laughs> okay, so Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. That's the one I expected you guys to probably say, right? All right. Those were literally the most unbelieving cities. But what's he follow that with? Mighty works that were done in you. Woo! If they were done another day, they would have listened. If they'd done Son and Gomorrah, they would have listened. So the most unbelieving cities had the most mighty works done. Holy smokes. So how much do you want to let unbelief in someone else influence whether you're willing to pray for them? Now, you might ask, Corey, do you ever see differences between people pray for? Sure I do. I, however, don't see Jesus ever pausing to stop and say, it's that person. So I basically never allow that for myself. And yeah, I will have one person pray for, and it's just radically fast. And another person I may have to pray for several times. I don't, I'm not going to worry about it. You know what I will do instead? Is I will start building myself up more, release Jesus more, so that the next time I encounter that same person who took maybe five tries, or three, or two, or maybe even one, and I know that that works because when I was learning and, and trying to stretch out, I didn't want to pray for I literally told the Lord, I'm not going to pray for Christians anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a silence there that was an intentional silence. He can, God can actually talk to you with a weighted silence. I don't know if you've experienced it, but it's almost like he leans over. <laughs> that, is that what you're going with? And you're like, okay, well, I'll pray for them, but they suck. They're so, they're so hard to pray for. Nowadays... I don't care, Christian, non-Christian. Do I see differences? Sure. Am I seeing those differences change? Yes. See, the biggest take-home, if I can give you one, am I over that? My time is inside. I can talk for like five hours. Oh, my Lord, it's going fast. Okay. Um, the biggest take-home I can give you is this. You want to grow in faith. You want to be a water walker. You want to change the world. It's not whether you had ten victories in a row. It's not whether you had ten failures in a row. It's what you did with truth during each one of those situations. Yeah. Okay? So, if at any point I value my experience, no matter how important it is, no matter how close to my heart it is, if I value that experience above the word in that situation, didn't matter if I succeeded, get this, guys, didn't matter if I succeeded or failed, I can actually be brought backwards in my growth 
<laughs> by valuing that experience above the word. And you might think, well, why would you care? Why would you be hurt by a good thing? Well, let's just say I finally am at peace because uh, I saw something victorious happen, and I wasn't at peace prior to that. I have moved by experience rather than by the word because Jesus gave us his peace, and he gave it to us not like the world gives it to us. It's, it's given, and then he says to you, therefore, don't let yourself be afraid. Don't be troubled. Whoa, wait a second. If you made me at peace, why do I have to then take control of this and make sure I'm not troubled by it? Why would I have to make sure I'm at peace? That doesn't really make sense if he gave it to me. As I told someone earlier today, God's peace is duck independent. Now, what do I mean by that? Quack, quack, quack. So you have multiple ducks in a row, and it's all perfect. You've got your money, your health, everything else is the world version of peace. There you got it. you got peace. Jesus is works when your ducks are everywhere. They're duck independent. Okay? So if that's the case, then we have to command something or we've got to take control. See you guys. Love you. Uh, I think all my YouTube things are going to end up like that. Someone leaving in the middle of it and I say bye to them. <laughs> I drive all my friends away. <laughs> anyway, it tells you there's an awfully big responsibility and that brings me back to, I think, one of the most important pieces. I say that a lot because all of this is really important. Oh, important. <sighs> Understanding the line between works and believing and just sort of sitting in it. Right? There's one thing for which you labor, scripturally speaking. Does anyone know for what thing you labor? Yeah. 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 To enter into rest. Labor. Enter into his peace. Labor. Yeah. Yeah, boy, God likes these contrarieties, these things that look contrary but aren't they? Like, it's, uh, it's interesting. Here's the thing. I will use this, but I, I guess I should give another picture first. When someone creates, I'm backing up a little bit just to give uh, some uh, context. If you create something, or if I create something, it is, when I'm done, less complex than the thing that created it. Okay? So even like you might think, oh, a man can create a computer. Well, even that's not true. A whole bunch of people work together, concerted their will, their effort, their skills to create a computer, but even that's less complex than us. Okay, I say that for this reason. The kingdom of God is 100% real. I mean, it is more real than what I see because this stuff is subject to change. Barring the Lord coming back one day, I will have even less hair. <laughs> and, uh, and one day I'll, I'll you know, Go to sleep and not wake up. It's subject to change. But if my head falls from my shoulders this very moment, something about me sta stands and lasts. That's kingdom. That's my spirit. And it's from the kingdom. Yeah, it lasts. So that's the real, the real, really real. So everything I see is subject to change. That's why when I pray for someone, I can pull from the kingdom and make it appear in the flesh. Now, it's subject to change. So I will sometimes guard the person's heart and instruct them on how to protect it. Oh, Corey, where do you see that scripture? Glad you asked. Jesus, when he prayed for him, prayed for him, and he took him outside the city, prayed for him, and he, it wasn't that he had to take him out of the city to pray for him. He took him out because he was telling him never to come back. So I do the same thing. I will treat a person who I've gotten well. I will tell them how to protect that. But I don't use any rules in advance for them to feel the manifestation. It takes a lot of pressure off people whole lot because I will never no matter which one of you comes up here and no matter how fast my success or whatnot is I will not put it on you to make it happen otherwise you guys probably wouldn't be asking for prayer yeah. I mean that's just the truth of it I walk in divine health so I don't have to go somewhere and ask someone but that doesn't mean I'm going to judge someone and go oh, you really need to get this right before I'm willing to invest my prayer right now anyway that's just a little side note I want those things to start getting unrooted because I know that when I went to pray for people, I had a lot of good, solid foundation, but I had a few things that I hid behind. And like this pulpit, if unbelief in the person is something that you will allow to stop you for any reason, guess what? You'll find that pulpit everywhere. And we'll blame that as the reason it wasn't fast or whatever. And I'm not saying people don't have a role. I realize that. And I'm, I don't want to say that there's no importance because obviously you need to train. You need to understand, you need to grow, and you want them to grow. 
it's perfectly fine. I just won't let that stop me looking like Jesus. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Because when I would go to pray for people, I would hesitate that I tell them enough about this to set this up so that they would be willing to believe. So I went the opposite direction for a while, and I said, I'm not going to tell testimonies at all. And I forgot to give testimonies. Did I get any testimonies? Well, whatever. You just have to believe me. Uh, and, and, C and Cecil told me when I was in Russia, he said, you know, after I spoke there, he said, you should tell people testimonies so they actually know that you, that you know what you're talking about instead of just jumping into it. But I, I, I was swung so far the other direction, I didn't even want to tell anyone anything. Like, no, it's just it's going to be believing, and that's it, and you're going to see it. And I don't care if you uh, have a good story or not. But anyway, it changed my life to realize that I could start stretching beyond what I experienced. That's the key. What do you do with truth? Do you become sharpened by it? Reduced by it? You choose. That's it. You choose. Which means I could have 100 failures in a row. And I will be a stronger man of faith at the end of those 100 failures than I was at the start. Truth be told, though, you won't have 100 failures in a row. If you're handling the truth the right way, you hit on it, you'll encounter someone uh, just a little bit later, and it's going to be extraordinary. My dog got ran over by a truck in February. I had never prayed for anything to come back from the dead, and I was very emotionally hit. Because it's in my lane. How do you miss a black dog on white snow in Montana? I have no idea. I don't have a lot of things around there. Killed him straight up. I tried for 25 days to bring him back. Now, that sounds impressive. But if I'm, if I'm full disclosure here so you know my heart, I also know how long I can maintain faith and be actually expecting in that moment before I start just doing the action and not really believing behind it. And I try to grow that window. And I try to grow the volume that I release at once. But I recognize that there's times where you could just be doing the emotions and you actually damage your heart because you're reminding yourself all the time, failure, 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 failure. So you, there's a balance. So I, I did 25 days in a row, but no time was more than an hour and a half which sounds like a long time. Admittedly, it's a long time. I, when I started believing for 15 solid seconds, honest to goodness, really expecting change for 15 seconds seemed like going to the moon. It did. But you can change in that. So my point in saying this, I didn't succeed with my dog. But in the midst of that, I saw some very ridiculously cool healings because I was sharpening myself against that every day, not shifting from truth and believing that. I, I would say over it, I would be between tears and everything. Thank you, Father, that I have it. I have resurrection life. And I will never back from that, even if I die trying or I fail to get this dog. It will not change me. It will not change me. That is sharpening. So I didn't have to be dulled by that. So what we did instead is we started, after I buried that dog, oh, by the way, funny, God, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny. Why not? It's ironic, at least. The, uh, the neighbor had a 15-year-old uh, lab whose eyes were gray with cataracts. My plow broke. This is while my dog is dead and I'm trying to bring it back. I go there to have him help me uh, fix the plow and his dog like comes over to me and he, he would feel by his nose to know where you're at. I mean it was gray. And he didn't, his, his owner didn't ever want me praying for anyone or anything so I didn't push it but I did go ahead and pray for the dog and I just didn't tell him. And the cataracts melted in about three minutes. Two weeks later he uh, he's, comes to help bury my dog and I see the dog notice me from a field away and head toward me. In the daylight, eyes as clear as glass. I mean, perfectly clear. <laughs> so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm there burying my dog. I'm having a failure. I missed it. And at the same time, got sharpened enough to see, you know, what's a totally normal, natural thing in the flesh melt away. So you can be sharpened. Then my wife said, we should quit waiting until something we care for dies. We should practice. We have three very blessed predator cats. <laughs> they kill plenty of things. And so my wife said, we're going to start uh, praying for that. And I said, good idea. And then the next one she brought was, well, she didn't bring it. It was stuck to the deck with its organs dried there. <laughs> I'll be honest, I didn't succeed there either. But I did try. <laughs> I did try because, darn it, got to start somewhere. Uh, so I turned it over and went, <laughs> it was, it was something. And I'm like, at the end I went, name Jesus, fly. So, fell down. So 
But about four days later, we had another bird uh, join the uh, adventure with my cats. And uh, my wife had to come out there because it was still blinking. Now, its, it's wing was all like that. And it wasn't moving its head. Its right leg was in. Its, it's left leg would twitch, but that was about it. Uh, we got to see that thing. Uh, well, it actually went from being pulled in like this. You guys are going to love this visual. It's a bit like a dog. You're doing really well. <laughs> My visuals? Yeah. Okay, well, good. Here we go. So its leg was curled in, and after about five minutes, which, by the way, is a long time when you're really trying to bleed. It really is. Anyway, I'm going, you know, animals are easy to pray for, Father. What's wrong with you? And you told me to shut up. So I, I shut up. And then at some point, it goes like this. And then it pulled in its wing. And it could use its uh, could use its uh, right leg again. And a few hours later, after a couple, uh, basically, I'd go every half an hour check on it. I put it in the uh, trellis, hopefully above cats, up with my attention. And I go back, bless it, and then go back inside. And on the third time of me doing that, my wife wanted to see it, and I immediately thought, well, it's not all the way yet. And I thought, oh, shut up. I said, it's much better than it was. Let's come out there. So she, because it had a hole in its neck and everything, guys. I mean, it looked. It didn't have its organs out, praise the Lord, but it didn't look good. Um, and, and we go out there and I say, you know, thank you, Father, because it turned its head. That's the first time I'd seen it turn its head again since that time. Looked at me. I go I, from here to there. I pray for it again. I mean, I held it for 15 minutes total. I say, thank you, Father. The rest of that pain, just leave right now. Go. And the bird goes, and a little feather falls as it flies off into the 70 or 80 yards into the trees. I'm like, well, that's another step. So I'm waiting. I told the bird, I did, I tried to give him wisdom, you know, when you impart. And I said, you know, the predators are blessed in my house because they're mine. Don't come near here. It's just, you still don't have much of a chance. There's too much blessing. So I trust that he's left and they're not doing that anymore. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I, I want to open up to questions again regarding the unbelief thing. Are there any lingering questions on the unbelief? Because this is so critical. Does anyone disagree? In all honesty, do you disagree? Because I'd be okay. I'd be open to that too, and I want to know the reason, and we'll talk it. Yeah. So I have a question. So if I know that the, in the word it says that, <clears throat> you know, that as Christians we can lay hands and mm -hmm. and uh, believe God and all that, but about animals, is that I don't know. Um, to no. me. Yes, I think to the mercy of God and his goodness, he'll do it, but that's not a promise for us to bring or try to bring the animal alive. Yeah, fair so, enough. So, yeah, my question is. Yeah, that's, that's, that's excellent. That's actually a phase I went through with trying to understand as well. My question, first of all, is this. This is the easiest way to take any question. If Jesus manifests in the flesh, you saw him in his, I don't know what outfit they wore, his skirt and sandals, <laughs> right then, would he have problem manifesting that? Do you think he'd be willing to? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, if we're supposed, if he's the perfect image of the Father, and I'm supposed to be a perfect image of him, as he is in the Father, then guess what? I'm empowered to do the same thing. This is why the Bible says that all of creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God, because they're still under the curse of Adam. And yet what Jesus did, it says, was so much more than what Adam did. What Adam did affected the farthest out galaxies. Guys, the stuff you can't even see. What Adam did instantaneously broke order all the way through there. So if Jesus undid that and so much more, what's that look like? It looks a lot cooler than, you know, suffering through an awful lot of things. I'm not saying there's not challenges. I, guys, I get... I, I traveled for this. I do this very rarely because it's a situation at home. I take care of my grandmother. I've got five kids. I work. I have to travel for work. So I don't do trips very often. This is, it's very challenging. So I worked this out and uh, flew to Illinois where I had friends there because I came from Illinois originally. Um, God forgave me and got me out of it. And anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I live in Montana now. I used to live in Peoria. Uh, anyway, lost by that sin thing. Traveling yeah, traveling is hard. That's true, it is. Uh, I don't recall the saying, darn it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah.
the question is, um, I have been heard and heard and I've been taught that your unbelief can block your healing. Well, I'm coming for a healing. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but I'm coming for it mm -hmm. because I'm believing that Jesus is a healer. Mm -hmm. So now I'm really going to be happy when I'm healed. Yeah. So does the unbelief block your healing? As the minister, it does. So if you're ministering to yourself, guess what? As the minister. Yeah. That's why he said. Well, you kind of have to say in. I am not allowed to move. And that is where integrity of your heart is so important, guys. Because I will tell you, I, it's a journey. This question gets asked fairly often. How do you know when you're bleeding? It's a fair question. It comes, from, it comes from practice. Now, I can give you guys some very practical steps that get you manifesting very, very, very quickly. But, and I'll go, I'll go ahead and spend a few minutes doing that. Uh, you'll like this, actually. For those of you who have like a 50% ratio, if you're honestly assessing... I know it's not about the numbers, it's about Jesus. So I'm not trying to get you lost in weeds here. I'm not going to have a report card where I want you guys to show me exact percent. Is that uh, to the second place or not? You know, we don't care about that, right? But we can, as long as we do it with the right eye, we got to see it like Jesus sees it. Because there's no condemnation in him. When we are pursuing these things of truth and we're, we're genuinely in the integrity of our heart growing in him, there's no condemnation. Failure after failure after failure. There is no condemnation. It's the most freeing thing in the world. But at the same time, you don't want to fail and just not care because you don't want to, you don't care if you change or not. It's on Jesus. It's in Jesus' hands now. Well, you know, it's very easy for us to do that. It is. But it's not good. So part of this growing process is recognizing when you're in the unbelief or not. And even when you think you're pretty good at it, you'll probably still find time. Because the Bible says you get caught up with civilian affairs. That's how it refers to it. And that's really what unbelief comes down to. It's other inputs, whether it be visual or whatever, that are speaking to you so loudly you can no longer hear truth. And it's very easy to... You know, if faith were so super, super duper easy and always worked exactly as you wanted it to, there wouldn't be any healing ministers or people that have great stories. There'd be everyone's, oh yeah, like be healed. You just now you can get to that point where it's so easy you can't believe others aren't doing it that easily. But that is a journey, I promise you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a journey. But we can make it shorter. You have someone who sharpens you, it makes it shorter. Pretty soon. I had a person in Belize who through a translator I taught them. <laughs> They taught someone else the next day because they were so changed by it, radically changed by it. That person, having heard the message from him that I told him the day before through a translator, brought a turkey back from the dead. Having never seen anyone healed in his life, brought a turkey back from the dead. So, I mean, that's fast. That's not much turnaround time at all. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm glad it wasn't me in a way. In fact, at that church, I saw a number of things, and I could have technically seen more except that I knew my heart well enough to turn my eyes away and pray. For example, there's a little boy who had a club foot, severely club foot. He was about five or six years old. And the mother wanted me to pray for him. And to give you some perspective, the mother had had me pray for her other child who they were waiting for a surgeon to cut the sword open and stretch it because he had a shrunk esophagus. It was too narrow for food. And uh, I prayed for that child, waited for like five seconds, and she told me that she'd be able to tell visually. And she wanted to show me, and I said, no, no, I don't want to see you know, don't let me don't let me even see it because I I just didn't trust myself with it. So, she uh, she said okay yeah, through the translator, and I pray and I have her check. She opens her mouth, says something, and no emotion hardly at all. And I said, is it no change or something? She goes, no, it's good. I'm like oh okay, so that's the emotional baseline. I need you to understand. Okay, so there wasn't a whole lot of movement. It's like okay, great. That's well, praise the Lord. Uh, okay, and then she gives me her next kid, um, very clubbed foot. And I'm holding these feet in my hands. And I just, I turn away. And I have a crowd that gathered around. It happens a lot. I've had it all over the place. And I just say, in the name of Jesus, foot be as you. And you're supposed to, whatever. I don't even remember. Because I hear the mother <laughs> just start bursting out in tears. And literally a collective gasp. I'd never heard that before. That actually happens. People actually collectively gasp. Because of, <gasps> and the kid's foot went, 
and grew to be the normal size. By the time I looked back, I'm just looking at two normal feet, and I didn't get to see it because I couldn't trust myself with it. Wow. Yeah. So you, being aware of that, I think, is important because I want you guys to know that some things visually impact me more. I'm growing. I don't have to be stopped there. But some things shake me more, if I'm be, just being honest. I'm still growing. After all, I'm not a minister. I'm just a Christian right software. You shouldn't even expect much from me. <laughs> but, but my comment was about that, that we're, not, we're not just having a kid so that they're big enough to try to get. And it reminded me of that old saying about you don't teach sheep, you don't teach even fish to shoot the yeah. fish. You're always teaching, you're always teaching by example because you're equipping others yes. to have faith. Yes. That's what a gift really is. Because I don't have Holy Spirit Junior, or I don't distribute Holy Spirit Junior, or Holy Spirit Light Edition. That's what a lot of us act like we have. Mm -hmm. If I have the Holy Spirit, I have the full edition. Mm -hmm. Yearly fees included. It's the whole thing, every upgrade. So if I have that and you have that, why would you need me? Why would I need you? It, see, we have it, but what we don't understand is how to let it out. We are jars of clay filled with fire. That's what the, the picture the Bible gives us. You can see it with Gideon. You put torches under uh, uh, the, the jars of clay, and then the Bible refers to it two other times. It's an important picture. It means I can contain that fire 100% because they had no idea there was fire there. It was in a torch underneath the, in the vessel, and they couldn't see it. So they couldn't see it, which means I can walk around with the fire of God so blaringly bright that demons are terrified of me, and you guys can't see a thing. So we choose how much we crack that jar, how much we let it out and whether we try to put the pieces right back and cover it again. It's, it's up to us, and it's a journey, and I don't take condemnation when I miss it, but I can tell you that the ratios will change with time. <coughs> Who here wants some, pro go ahead. It's usually in Latin, and I'm like, does anyone here know Latin? Because I'm hearing the Father speak to me. And imagine, I'm kidding, guys. <laughs> like, Latin? That's strange. It's got to be in Scripture. It changes. It, flu it fluctuates. It depends on whether you want to use that. So, I do it based on what I have a word on. So, you're thinking, oh, you've got a word. Well, I have a word that basically tells me in scripture that anyone I see is a candidate for God's love. Amen. So I have a mighty big drive for that. Now I also see in Jesus, because that's, that's the high court, I see Jesus saying, what do you want from me? When the person's standing there with two milky eyes, he says, what do you want? So guess what I do? <coughs> what do you want? Now and then, very rarely, it's very rarely for a reason, I, I guess I should tell you. Now and then, now and then he, said, he will say something, and that's usually for that person. It's to open them up, and I just roll with it. I can stir that up, though, if I want. Ooh. See, I can go pray for a sick person and get them well whenever I darn well please, which means if it's another aspect of the kingdom, another aspect of the spirit, I can get words of knowledge whenever I need to, too. It's just nice to learn from someone who's really good at words of knowledge and ask them if they can, if they can self-assess that. All right, what's going through you? How do you think about that? What, what do you believe? How do you believe that way? What scriptures do you... I mean, all this stuff, you get trained by the person, you can get better and better and better at that, too. I used to actually only use words of knowledge, and I didn't even know I was using them. So I, test, I guess technically I was gifted in that, but I have pushed that almost to the side in my just rapid pursuit of truth when it comes to the healing that I, I almost never rely on it, except for when I'm forced to, which did happen in Belize because I had a prisoner... He comes up and he says, I need to know what he says. I said, who? Because I thought it was another prisoner that he was talking about, you know, because he could be shipped or something. I'd already prayed for other people, but, you know, he said, what did he say? And he wanted a word from God. So I'm like, I was happy with the people who needed prayer, but I was extremely uncomfortable with talking to this person through a translator on topics that only the Holy Spirit knows because I can't even use my experience or my practice, right? But I know, like, well, she look what I'm going to run up. I just started describing a scene. I saw a picture that came up. That's how that stuff works. And he had no emotions, so I wasn't getting positive feedback. I'm like, uh, 
So I see a blue boat flaking paint on it. There's a woman with long hair in it. And I, it's just a picture, as far as I know, of it in my head. Okay? And he gives no response after me five minutes of talking to him. And I said, does any of that uh, make sense? And he goes, <laughs> starts bawling. And yeah, it all made sense. But I didn't know. Good night. It's terrifying. I guess that's what walking in faith is, right? It's, it's something, but that's how that stuff works. Healing is just like that. But if you do that a lot, what happens is the next person it's easier for. So if someone right after I'd asked for a word of knowledge, I would have guessed what? It would have been easier for me. Healing is the same way. You decide what thing you want to really grow in, what thing you want to just explode in, and then just keep adding to it so you look so much like Jesus, people can come to you for anything. And yeah, that's what this is all about. So if any theology you have, any belief system, excuses you in any way, shape, or form to look less like Jesus in that moment or throughout the growth of your life, throw it out, kick it, just burn it up. And that includes silliness like, uh, well, you know, you're, you're a human, so you will get sick. You're, when you get older, you will have things that break down. Screw that. No, apologies, but that's, that's nonsense. Same thing with, how about, uh, how about sin? Oh, well, you're a human, so you're always going to sin. That is such a common thing. We excuse to look less like Jesus. And since I don't see that in Jesus, ever him, he never said, well, you are a human, so you're going to. You're going to be sinning a lot. I'm going to go to the cross for that very thing, you sinner. He, he, it wasn't, it, you don't see it in him. So you don't see that expectation in us. I'm not saying you won't ever make a mistake. But you, if the right goal, at least you can start heading to the right place. If I set the bar lower, I mean, even if you, you hit that, you're still less than what Jesus looked like. And I, I give you a, a little frightening truth. Jesus said that, uh, well, uh, let's, let's word this the right way. Jesus was a perspective for us, and he tells us that, okay, there's going to be people coming after him that do greater things. Now, there's argument about what the greater thing means. It could be distance. I mean, I, if someone back there was sick, I could point to them, and they'd be healed. It's not that hard. Okay, distance doesn't really matter. So I guess you could argue that it's greater if the person way back there gets healed. But all that's sort of irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. My point is that this, if he says, Jesus himself, these letters are in red. He says, this is... This is what I'm doing. Some of you will be doing up here. And we know from experience, plenty of people down here, what's that, what's that mean this is? It's the average Christian bar. Average Christian bar. It's not a candy, but it'd be a good one. Uh, it's the mark for what identifies an average Christian in God's mind. Wow. He didn't even try giving you the one that was unattainable. He didn't say, well, you'll get real close sometime. He said, there's going to be someone come across that do more. Because I go back to the Father. So there's some adjoining and agreement stuff going on. Isn't that awesome? Yes. That means that's totally attainable. Yes. It's attainable. You don't have to be a special gifted person. You can go write software, bake donuts, whatever. <laughs> it's true. All right, so does anyone want some practical hands-on stuff as far as to how... Yeah, okay. I, I figured that's usually really helpful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right to a, a, uh, a secret. I hate that. But, yeah, <laughs> secret. This one's super special. Only if they pay twice as much for this video do they get this clip. Make sure you separate it. Um, B. <laughs> the, the big secret is this. Okay. Uh, I better use this one. So this, <laughs> this bottle is utterly and completely filled with water. Water is what water is. Oh, yeah, great. So you put it on the right things, it does what water does every time without failure. Faith is this process of realizing that I'm filled with the Spirit of God. And it does what it does. If I pour it out, what does the Spirit of God do? It starts looking like Jesus. It has the gifts of the Spirit, as we would say. It has, I pour it out, there would be joy, love, peace, health, prosperity, patience, long-suffering. It looks just like him. That's inside me. Now, here's the great thing. I don't know how to be all those things. Well, the Bible says your responsibility is to take captive every thought, every high place. Okay? So one of the biggest changes in me was a simple one. I would pray for someone. Hey, if someone want to be my uh, guinea pig here, I'll just take a chair. And you want to, want to be my person, I'm going to show you something. Actually, you can just come up. You don't need a chair. Let's say Nancy. 
She told me. It wasn't a word to know. <laughs> Full disclosure, right? So let's say she's got a bad shoulder. I will, I will command that thing to be whole. I won't ask God for a thing. Because I can do that. I can, and they will get healed. But, uh, and I do now and then just for kicks and giggles to help the person out so they understand where it's coming from. But it, this, is a, this is a battle between a son of God. I am a son of God. My spirit's joined with him. And that thing, bring it. That's what I, that's, there's something inside me that rises up and says, you try, you dumb devil. Not you, the thing in there. Anyway, so she says, oh yeah, it hurts if I do that, I can't hardly lift it. I command that thing to be made whole. It doesn't really matter specifically the words. Here's the kicker. I take control of every thought for at least five seconds. So simple. So I command, and in the name of Jesus, right now. Now I'm setting my faith, and sometimes in my head I'm going one. Give Jesus a chance to do his job. But I'm also distracting myself from thinking, is it working? Is she feeling it? Yeah. The thousand voices that go through your head, get them. Crush them. Shut them up for five seconds. And then say, try it. Because you'll notice that Jesus, oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. That's what. <laughs> that's, you can sit down. That is so simple. It is so simple. But I cannot emphasize, that will take you, if you found that you're at like a 50% ratio, that will take you to easily 80% okay. of, of success. I, I said that to Craig and Belize at a care school, and he, I, you know, he gave me a very polite, okay. But he saw it, and now he has prayed for thousands of people since I was there. He has seen thousands of creative miracles now. <laughs> Craig, Craig uh, Rumbly. Rumbly. Love that man. So, I promise you that works. As long as you have the rest of the, it's not like um, you're not making it happen in, in, in some sense, but in another sense you are. I, I mentioned, oh, I got one minute. So I got, I mentioned there was one thing I wanted to, to point out. So if this is, uh, these are ducks, but right now we're going to pretend that's the kingdom of God, right? Okay. All right. This is access to the kingdom. This is use of the kingdom. All right, so you're right here. Yay! Yeah. Kingdom. <laughs> All right, oh, I broke a broken knee. Um, you can't work for this one, ever. You can't work for access. Yeah. Most importantly, you can't even let yourself assume that your actions control that. You can't. Because here's the thing, a person who gets in sin and is mad may think that they don't really have a right to pray. Or they condemn themselves and say, well, I wasn't very good. I don't, wasn't looking like a Christian. And so they add another sin to that by not praying for someone who needs it because they knew that they failed in a sin thing. But that's because they think right here that they're getting access that way. That's a lie. That is deceit. You can fulfill the entire law and fall from grace. I could live it perfectly, and that's falling from what Jesus did. That's what Scripture says. So I cannot let myself think that this in any way, shape, or form is worked for, not even by me praying for people or something. Never. This, however, oh, that requires you taking command of your thoughts and all that crap. You know, good stuff. And it can be tough. And it sometimes requires you persist. Because, no, I don't have to pray for you seven times. I, if I could just believe and hold on to that seed and make sure it gets protected by my believing never erring. But let's be honest, that very often we don't hold on to it perfectly, and the person does everything they can to dig it up, and between the two of you, that, that seed's gone, and the person never gets well. So I, I want to encourage you to go past what I'm doing. I want, you to be, I want to encourage you to go ahead and do the seed method where you just believe and extend the length of time that you believe. But if you don't see something changing, for their sake, push a little bit more. Pour a little more life in. It's, if this was the seed, oh, I could reuse my diagrams. Here's your seed. It looks like a coffee bean. That's very fitting for reasons. Anyway... You can keep pouring rain on it, and it's, maybe it's this much. They feel a little bit changed. Pour a little bit more. Because I know for a fact that I can water, I can minister, because some person may come across and, and, and plant the seed. Some may water. I can take a little bit of time and water and push. And go, they start feeling it. And then, if you do need to leave, at least they, they're, they're leaving relieved, and they now have a hope. You know what I mean? Okay, I've gone two minutes past, so the DVD is now six dollars. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> any more questions?
I don't, I, not, I don't, this, none of this is for me financially. Just so you know, I have a job, a different job. Yes. Yes. You want to know a fun trick, guys? If you have one more minute, yeah. it's Jesus. Uh, if Jesus is the high court, guess what he did when the disciples failed? He got mad at them, as you know, told them they were at fault. And guess what his next step was? His response to it. He said, "Okay, you guys go out, go to the towns you're going to. You're going to say, Kingdom of God is." Here. And that's the picture you get because he said it's within you in one verse. He says the kingdom of God is here. So what are they pointing to? Themselves. Saying the kingdom of God is here. Heal their sick, raise their dead, etc., etc., etc. That's what he told them in response to their unbelief part. It seems like it'd be the other way around. Like, well, shouldn't we teach them about how to have belief better first? No, he said go out. Because the easiest place to manifest is out there when you look potentially like an idiot. Faith is not risk. That's a lie. Some people have said it. I love the people. It doesn't really matter. Faith does not, is not spelled risk. But risk is, in fact, a lever that you can use. Like your muscles are, it's very simple stuff, right? You, you know, I could lift the rock if I was strong enough. Or I could take a crowbar and go and lift it faster and easier. That's what risk is. Anyway, okay. Any other questions? Uh, my question is, is that uh, if you've ever encountered this, you're able to uh, pray, pray for certain people that you might know or might know, but then certain people, like say in your family, like your wife, Pray for the same thing and it doesn't work, but it'll work for someone having a support, like right? A headache or something. Yeah. Do you think you perceive your wife or someone else differently? I, the yeah. answer to that oh, is yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm married to everyone, man. I'm just messing. I'm messing with you. I talk really fast. I'm just. I'm just. No, no. You, so you, you perceive them differently. And all of this stuff about gifts is perception, right? Yeah, I have seen it. But I've also persisted, and my household mostly is wealth. Oh, that was the reason I was telling you about the, the travel. My, my mother yesterday had a heart attack, and I'm on the phone listening to her gasp me for air. She's fine now. We commanded through it. But it's, and then our, we have an earthquake that shut off the water. And it, it's all these things the enemy tries to steal, but do I change because of that junk? No. Even if I lost my mother and failed to heal her, no. will I change from this course? No. They don't have a right. Anything else? I mean, I'm not particularly rushed, but I, I don't want to miss. Yeah, we can stay two more hours. So, um, your children that have yeah. your policy, okay. I'm praying for my daughter mm -hmm. and learning about that. So, did yeah. you have to stand in faith? And, and yeah. I don't know how to say stand in faith. Good that's word. all I hear. Stand oh, in that's faith. Oh, that's I understand. <laughs> I understand more than most more than most people who ever meet, I will understand that. Um, I have had various victories, steps along the way. Like I, burning my dog, that dog story. Um, okay, you need to understand though that the boys had cerebral palsy and severe for two of them. Okay, so that means arms up like this. Um, spastically, one of them, Warren, couldn't even separate his legs at all. So it'd be like he could bend them both or whatever. I, I had been in a journey with that, and just recently I saw from one prayer to the next, my son go, and we get full control of the legs up and down. And he started giggling and cheering because he knew what happened in his own body. Now, hon, imagine how long I've been fighting this, this process. About eight years. Should it be that way? No. Do I have anyone I can go to? No one but Jesus. So now you know why I'm sitting here because it's a kingdom rule, guy. guys. I live by kingdom rules as much as possible. In the flesh, I give you my marker. These markers are great. You should sell them as an advertisement. I give you my marker. I'm now one marker less. But what's the kingdom principle in giving? When you give, you have more. And the reason is, uh, imagine a, a number eight running and it trips, falls over, you have an infinity symbol. Take away $50 from that infinity symbol of money, money, and you still have infinity symbol of money. You still have an infinite supply, and you have $50. It looks like you have more. It's like playing in a river and saying to the thirsty, oh, you want some water, and you have to keep doing it. Pretty soon, you're soaking wet. That's what healing is for me, and that's why uh, it's so easy to live out, but it's because I am constantly have to go to that river, and I'm learning to stand. So what I suggest for you in your situation 
is, is the, these individual moments where you can flex your faith and your expectation, even if it's only for a few seconds. Take command of the thoughts and then keep reapplying until you start seeing change. Yeah, the command of the thoughts. Now, I, I do have the little, I'm, I'm going over, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, the command of the thoughts can be ex extended to learning to just realize that you have not, if you have the mind of Christ, you've got to recognize the tuning fork of which thing is him, which thing is not him. Okay? His voice, the devil's voice, and your own voice sound the exact same in your head. Mm. Spoiler alert. So a lot of people are thinking that you'll get a special voice. Occasionally you might hear something, but you do not go by that. You go by scripture firm, for, firm first book. You go by Jesus' life as a uh, focusing tool beyond that. Okay? Yeah. So if I have a verse that's out of line, I like it makes something that would look less like Jesus, I have to look at Jesus and say, oh, I must be misinterpreting that. Fix it. Right? But this taking command of thoughts leads you down a path of realizing, well, if I have the mind of Christ, that's how words of knowledge work. That's how creation works. That's how giving someone a new knee works. You know why? Because when Jesus says, let it be, or the Father says, light be, he has a picture of what that is in his mind. He applies this will, and with a couple words, it goes out. We're doing the same thing. You know why? Because our bodies were made to be inhabited by him, a special type of spirit, Elohim spirit. That's crazy. But this is literally his version of having children. It's quite literally that. So we're inhabited by his spirit. We've got to learn to command it. That led me down to realizing that if that's the case, then I can, whatever I can imagine and believe, I can have. So you have a sickness. I, I want to demonstrate to someone that you can bonk them on the head with the water bottle. I could heal her by throwing this, if I could hit her on the head, and hit her on the head with that. It sounds ridiculous, but who's choosing how that happens? I do. The reason Jesus did so many weird things and never repeated it, it wasn't to make this obtuse and hard to understand. He was doing it to demonstrate that it's a kingdom principle he's using, and whatever works for you in that moment, that's what you do. I could choose to not ever lay hands. I lay hands because, first of all, it's one of the most direct contacts, but love likes touching. Love, love embraces, right? So I lay hands, but not because I'm limited by that. I've had, I don't know how many can cases of cancer tumors leave over the phone where the person could feel the tumor and then gone the second after, and I'm nowhere near to lay hands. But if I can lay hands, sure. Sounds great. <laughs> and I'm exhausted. The spirit has left. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Am I shake you guys up? Yeah, it's interesting. Very. It's, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty intense. Now the nice thing is that hopefully, when I'm gone, you guys will feel actually more capable of seeing greater things than you did prior to being here because it's not about me. Most of those people in the least that are doing miracles now it's, don't actually even know my name. They've heard it from person to person, and they're just doing their thing. And awesome things are happening. Corey never was involved. And that's the best way for it to be. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm good for ministering with people, but you want to close it out in whatever way? Oh, I thought he was ushering me. He had a hook with cane thing. To... No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm willing to, to to minister whoever needs to pray for. Uh, but uh, any more questions? Awesome. I've answered every question. Okay. Praise the Lord. Well, that, that's awesome. So we'll just have a little bit of um, instruction here. Um, we'll move we'll move the pulpit out of the way, and if you need a chair, we can pull. Um, here's our blue chair. <laughs> so if you guys want to um, come up one at a time, you don't have to have a chair, but if you need a chair, there's a chair. And um, so you're free. Obviously, to go, we're going to get the CDs done again um, in the front office. You're welcome to grab um, the CDs and, um, and help yourself if there's leftovers in there. But just let's keep an attitude of um, just being before the Lord, okay, in belief.
believing and just keeping, you know, your voice down a little bit while he's praying. Amen. ingrained in yourself the way you release your authority is with yelling. Now, I don't see that in Jesus much. It does happen, guys. For the most part, he was soft-spoken. Uh, so I usually am soft-spoken. Now and then, I get a little aggressive, and just like he did, and do something loud. To be honest with you, it's not for the devil or for me. It's mostly for you that are the lever of people are all sitting in their faith at this time. That's, that's about it. So you might have to yell, but you throw in to others. Don't be bound by Oh, the baby? Yes. The baby. Uh, yes. Hey, Gail, should I cut the light, please? 